Hola, queridos, y bienvenidos a nuestro servicio de adoración. Welcome to Hunker Down Worship. Today, coming to you straight from Montreat Retreat Center in North Carolina. Uh, you can see behind us, we've got some lovely North Carolina hills and woods, and we thought it might be fun to give you a little taste of where we are right now. Uh, we're getting ready to begin the um, arts, recreation, and worship uh, workshop um, conference here in North Carolina, one that Beth has attended many times. I've been here once before, so it's really kind of fun for us to be here again. Es un gusto poder compartir un poco de la belleza uh, de este lugar. Uh, just a couple of reminders as we get started for worship. Uh, if you have any kind of pastoral emergency while we're away, um, please contact Reverend Consuelo Donahue. Uh, Consuelo is available to come and be with you or visit you in the hospital or any family members that you have an urgent need uh, for. So please uh, contact Consuelo or contact the church office and leave a message and Lorena can look uh, for that. Um, another little caveat, as you may already have heard, there's some extraneous noise since we're recording outside and there's a road behind us. So we're gonna do our best to talk louder than the, uh, the noise outside, but we thought the beauty of the place, the birds overhead, all of that would be worth uh, worth the occasional in, car yeah, driving by. Yeah, the occasional by. car driving by. So, uh, so we'll see, I hope it goes well today, we'll see. Um, also, just a reminder, un recordatorio, de que el 16 de mayo, the 16th of May, our plan is to be back at church in the sanctuary, socially distanced with masks on, uh, for 9.30 Spanish worship and 11 o'clock bilingual worship. So, el día, 26, uh, día 16 de mayo, uh, adoración en español a las 9 y media y bilingüe a las 11. So, I think that's it. San Antonio seems to be doing a great job. The last word I heard was that our uh, COVID positivity numbers are below 2%. So keep up the good work, everybody. If you haven't got your vaccine, please get it. Now is the time. Everybody has vaccine available. Please don't wait. Our whole community, the common good of our community depends on you getting that vaccine. And our ability to get together as a family of worship also depends on us being safe together. So please do your part, get your vaccine, uh, and let's gather for worship on the 16th of May. So without further ado, uh, let us begin our worship time together remembering when Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me, will not walk in darkness, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But will have the light of life. Hermanos, amando, serviendo, compartiendo y creciendo en Jesucristo, vamos a adorar a nuestro Dios. Our opening uh, hymn today is Gente Nueva, Danos Un Corazón. And we'll sing along uh, with the words and the music that are going to come up right now. Danos un corazón grande para amar. Danos un corazón fuerte para luchar. Nueva creadora de la historia, constructora de nueva humanidad, gente nueva que vive la existencia como riesgo de un largo caminar. Danos un corazón grande para amar, danos un corazón para luchar gente nueva luchando en esperanza caminantes sedientos de verdad gente nueva sin frenos ni cadenas gente libre que exige libertad danos un corazón grande para amar Fuerte para luchar, 
gente nueva amando sin fronteras por encima de razas y lugar gente nueva al lado de los pobres compartiendo con ellos hecho y paz danos un corazón grande para amar danos un corazón fuerte para luchar fuerte para luchar Amén Adoración es algo que exige una entrega total de nuestra persona Our whole person is to be turned over to God as our spiritual service of worship. So says Paul in his letter to the Romans. As we turn ourselves over to God today, let us turn over the things we carry in our hearts, our, our worries and our anxieties, our hopes and our dreams, and our gratitude for what God has done in our lives. Let us come to God. Oyenos, mi Dios. Mi Dios, óyenos mi Dios, escucha a la gente, óyenos mi Dios. Lord, as we come to you today as one people, bringing our hearts to you, bringing our lives to you, we begin with gratitude. Gratitude for successful surgery for Sammy Hernandez, who had to go back in the hospital on Saturday. And we pray for his continued recovery and for his continued strengthening. And for his mom, Ignacia, and his dad, Ricardo. Pedimos por Samuel. We pray with gratitude, Lord, for the workers who are working hard to rehabilitate our 1929 building and give us a new facility that we can share in together. We give thanks for new audiovisual equipment which is being installed this week so that we will be able to broadcast our services far and wide and especially to those who are homebound. We pray, Lord, for the victims of the tra tragedy that occurred in Israel during a religious celebration killing nearly 50 people and we pray for all of those whose lives have been broken by that experience. We pray for the enormous suffering in India as they struggle with this second wave of COVID infections that is overwhelming their country. And pray for all the nations of the world to rally to support them in this moment. We pray for our nation and for all those who still don't see the vaccine as an important thing for them to get for the good of our common well-being. Lord, we offered continued prayers for my dad, Jim Mueller, and for Mary Suttles, who are both in recovery and rehab. My dad's in rehab, Mary Suttles is recovering. We lift up our prayers for our Congress as they consider how to best reshape our national priorities and our economy in the interest of our common good. And Lord, we lift to you any prayers that we each hold in our hearts as we gather this day. Let us bring those prayers to God at this time. And gathering up the prayers that we don't know how to speak, prayers that are too deep for words, let us take up the words of Jesus that bind us as one household of faith, as one family together, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oyenos mi Dios, oyenos, oyenos, escucha la gente, oyenos. Amen. You know,
know, in our endeavor to live faithfully in the way of Jesus Christ, we stumble and we fall all the time. Jesus leads us on a path that is at the same time both simple and incredibly difficult for us to completely fulfill. And so it is that God has given us the grace of forgiveness and the grace of confession, inviting us and offering us the opportunity to bring to God our failures so they don't bind us for our ability to act in the future. So let us bring to God now, ahora vamos a Dios en nuestra oración de confesión. Would you join me as we pray together? Our, Our statements, statements of faith, faith remind, remind us, us that, that we must listen to voices long silenced, but Lord, we tend to ignore them if they do not serve our own self-interest. We dismiss the voices we don't like to hear or whose demands challenge our privilege or require us to share. Forgive our selfish ways. Remind us that you pay particular attention to the outcry of the oppressed and that you don't take kindly to Pharaoh's resistance. Teach us to follow your lead and to mend our ways. Hear now our silent prayers. Let us each bring our own prayer of confession before the Lord in silence. Amén. Queridos, el salmista nos recuerda que el gran amor de Dios nunca termina. Que sus misericordias no se acabarán, sino que son nuevas cada mañana. Grande es tu fidelidad, Señor. Y por eso, por tu gran fidelidad, yo puedo declarar con confianza que en Cristo Jesús somos perdonados. Gloria a Dios. Aleluya. Amén. Last week, la semana pasada, I looked at a number of passages that talk about what it means to be a good shepherd. A good shepherd of the people. One who leads in the interest of the whole and not just in the interest of the few. We looked at Ezekiel's critique of the, of the shepherds who were bad shepherds in Israel. And we look also at John 10, and we looked at Psalm 23. And we're reminded how God's shepherding is always in the interest of the whole. Today we begin a series that's picking up texts that are reflected upon by Walter Brueggemann in a book he wrote about a decade ago called Journey to the Common Good. And Walter Brueggemann, in his study, examines three important moments historically in the life of Israel. The moment of their exodus, their slavery, and their freedom from slavery through the leadership of Moses. Then he looks at Jeremiah and the experience of the people of Israel in exile and how Jeremiah's prophecy encouraged and challenged them to continue to pursue the common good and not just their own self-interests. And finally, we will look, not all today, this is over the course of the series, finally we will look at the experience of return from exile and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and some of Isaiah's guidance for the people as they sought to rebuild the city to be more just, more faithful, more capable of meeting the needs of the whole community, the common good, and not simply those who were at the top. Today we begin examining the story of Israel in Egypt, a story that begins in the book of Genesis, at the very end of the story of Genesis. When we hear these words, which I will read from the 47th chapter of Genesis, verses 13 to 21. Esta historia de Genesis inicia el el cuento o la descripción de la esclavitud de los israelitas en Egipto y eventualmente su liberación a manos de Dios Todopoderoso y su sirviente uh, Moisés, su siervo Moisés. Entonces, we're going to pick up looking at 
this text from Jeremiah, I mean from Genesis chapter 47, verses 13 to 21. Primero en español. El hambre en Egipto y Canaá era terrible. No había alimento en ninguna parte y la gente estaba a punto de morir. Todo el dinero que los habitantes de Egipto y de Canaá habían pagado por el alimento, José lo recaudó para depositarlo en el palacio del faraón. Y cuando egipcios y cananeos se les acabó el dinero, los egipcios fueron a ver a José y le reclamaron, «Denos de comer. ¿Hemos de morir en su presencia solo porque no tenemos más dinero?» Y José les contestó, Si ya se les acabó el dinero, traigan su ganado, y a cambio yo les daré alimento. Los egipcios llevaron a José su ganado, es decir, sus caballos, vacas, ovejas, asnos, y a cambio de ellos, José les dio alimento durante todo ese año. Y al año siguiente, fueron a decirle a José, Señor, no podemos ocultar el hecho de que ya no tenemos más dinero y que todo nuestro ganado ya es suyo y ya no tenemos nada que ofrecerle de no ser nuestros propios cuerpos y nuestras tierras. ¿Va usted a permitir que nos muramos junto con nuestras tierras? Cómprenos usted a nosotros y a nuestras tierras y a cambio de alimento. Así seremos esclavos del faraón junto con nuestras tierras, pero denos usted semilla para que podamos vivir y la tierra no quede desolada. Y de esta manera, José adquirió para el faraón todas las tierras de Egipto, porque los egipcios, obligados por el hambre, le vendieron todos sus terrenos. Fue así como todo el país llegó a ser propiedad del faraón y todos en Egipto quedaron reducidos a la esclavitud. And now in English. There was no food in the entire region because the famine was so severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. And Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain that they bought, and he brought it into Pharaoh's palace. And when the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all of Egypt came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? All of our money is gone. Then bring me your livestock, said Joseph and I will sell you food in exchange for your livestock since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and he gave them food in exchange for their horses and sheep and goats, their cattle and their donkeys, and he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all of their livestock. And when that year was over, they came to him the following year and said, we cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes, we and our land as well? Buy us and our land in exchange for food, and we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so we may live and not die and that the land may not become desolate. So it is that Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them, and the land became Pharaoh's, and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. Hermanos y hermanas, esta es palabra de Dios. Te alabamos, Señor. This story begins the saga of Egypt's dominance over that entire region. A dominance that Joseph helped facilitate as Pharaoh's right-hand man. Josué ayudó a Faraón construir una economía 
que merecía y daba todos los beneficios a los que habitaban en el cumbre del pirámide de la sociedad y no daba más que comida a los que quedaron como esclavos. This is a fantastic description of the way in which an empire economy comes to fruition and comes to maturity as an economy that is interested in serving those who live at the top of the pyramid, in this case, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's court and Pharaoh's family and Pharaoh's favorites like Joseph. What it also demonstrates is how this kind of economy doesn't just happen. It is deliberate, intentional, purposefully constructed in order to benefit some at the expense of others. To benefit some who take advantage of the hunger of the desperate suffering of others in order to reap greater riches and greater power for themselves. In Walter Brueggemann's book, he begins by talking about the importance of the common good this way. He says, mature humans at their best are people who are committed to the common good, a good that reaches beyond their private interests, that transcends their sectarian commitments and offers human solidarity. In scripture, from the Old Testament all the way through the book of Revelation, Pharaoh is the paradigmatic emblem of an empire constructed out of selfishness, constructed out of self-interest drawn so tightly that it only serves those who live at the top of the pyramids. Why did Egypt build pyramids? Sure, they were burial tombs, but they were physical structures that visibly demonstrated the way in which their entire society was organized. At the bottom were the multitudes who slaved in order to build Pharaoh's riches. And at the top lived only the few, the very, very most powerful, the 1% or half of 1% as we have come to refer to them in our own nation in recent days. Pharaoh, through Joseph, exploits the hunger of the people, the need of the people, los que están muriendo de hambre, están no tratados con compasión, sino explotados para tomar lo poco que todavía tienen en el interés de enriquecer al faraón. How does this happen? First they come hungry and without any food because the land is dry and will produce nothing. And so they spend all of their money, their life savings, whatever that might have been, to get food. And they survive for a year. And the second year they come back and they have no money. And so what do they sell? They sell their livestock, the very means through which they are able to earn a living and feed their families with milk or eggs or meat. And Joseph gladly takes their livestock in exchange for enough food to survive. And the third year comes, and what happens? They have no livestock, they have no money. All they have is their bodies and their lands, ancestral lands, lands given to them over many, many generations. And these are then turned over to Pharaoh through Joseph. And the people become slaves just to eat. This slavery, says Walter Brueggemann, 
This slavery occurred through the deliberate manipulation of the economy in the interest of concentrating the wealth at the very top of the pyramid. What other effects does that kind of economic structure create? Otro efecto de una economía construida a base de la explotación de, los, de las masas es que los que están completamente consumidos por su trabajo no tienen tiempo ni espacio mental ni espacio imaginaria para poder contemplar una vida mejor, una vida libre, una vida común. One of the consequences of such a, an economy grounded in scarcity, there not being enough for everyone, but there being too much for some, is that the people who are scrambling to survive don't even have enough energy to be concerned about the common good, for their very survival is a day-by-day -day challenge. As Beth and I were driving up here, we were listening to National Public Radio and there was a story of a young woman who is a 30-year-old single mom with three kids. And she was the manager of a pizza, pizza parlor, of a pizza restaurant of some kind. But when COVID hit and the restaurant had to close, she lost her job. She lost it in part because her kids became homeschooled and she couldn't balance the realities between her kids' needs for her to help them with schooling and to be taking care of them and the needs of her job. And so her employer let her go. She struggled for a while with the kids. She tried to find odd jobs, but then the house that she lived in was sold by the landlord and she and her children were forced to live in their car for a number of months. When you are living that way, barely able to meet your children's needs, barely able to meet your own needs, unable to have a roof over your head, where do you have the space? Where do you have the, the place in your soul to even begin to think about how to help other people? It's literally impossible. And an economy that is crafted in such a way that keeps people so scurrying for the crumbs under the table that are trickling down from the top, that they don't have the capacity to organize themselves for the common good. The common good becomes an easily forgettable goal. Well, what happens in Egypt when this continues to be the case? What happens is that the people begin to experience such suffering that they start to cry out. They start to cry out in their suffering for some relief. And their pain reaches the heavens. And Yahweh, who pays particular attention to the voice of those who are exploited and oppressed, hears their cry and begins to turn the tables. But one other fascinating piece of the, of the empire's scarcity that, that also I think we can see occurring within our own world today, and we can see it occurring over the course of history, is that economies, especially empire economies that are organized around a mentality of scarcity, there's not enough for everyone, so we need to grab as much as we can get for ourselves. When that mentality of scarcity is dominant, then even Pharaoh, who has everything, feels worried that he's going to lose what he has. And as Pharaoh increases his oppression against the slaves, as he sees how many slaves there are and begins to be worried that these slaves might one day decide to turn on him and take away what he has, his repression becomes even more brutal. We see that same mentality of scarcity across the eons. 
We see it in the Persian Empire that, that expands and expands until it cannot sustain itself. The Babylonian Empire does the same thing. The Greek Empire does the same thing. The Roman Empire does the same thing. The Spanish Empire does the same thing with all of its exploration across the planet and its desire to conquer new lands, but the inability to hold them and govern them well. And then we have the British Empire, which again overextended itself to such a degree that they could no longer maintain the oppression of the smaller peoples, the weaker peoples, the hungrier peoples of the world that they were dominating. And today, it is our nation which stands at the top of the heap of world order. It is our nation which is the de facto empire of today. And we too live with an attitude of such scarcity that we deny things to people that are essential to life. We don't have enough to share with those who are hungry for a voice in our political system. We don't have enough to share our jobs and our economy with those who are migrating from many countries of the world seeking an opportunity to simply work. We don't have enough to pay for education or for health care for our whole population because there's not enough, even though we are the wealthiest nation on the planet. It is absolutely ironic that we, like Pharaoh, have come to fear scarcity in the midst of our plenty. Well, what happens in the story of Genesis and the story of Exodus as it unfolds is we discover that Yahweh listens to the cries of the suffering. Yahweh escucha el grito, el clamor del pueblo necesitado, el pueblo que vive en la margen, el pueblo que vive hambriento, el pueblo que vive sin trabajo, el pueblo que vive sin techo, el pueblo que vive sin tierra, Dios escucha su clamor, su necesidad de tener lo, lo más básico para poder sostener la vida. Empires, sadly, when they hear the outcry, instead of turning an ear of compassion, often turn an ear of repression. So, we find that Pharaoh, when he hears the workers crying out for better conditions, when he hears the workers cry out in their suffering, instead of doing something to alleviate the suffering in some act of solidarity with them in their suffering, what does Pharaoh do instead? Tell their taskmasters that Instead of just making bricks with straw, now they have to go into the fields and collect their straw and bring it back to make their bricks. And on top of that, their quota will remain the same. So now they will have to work extra hours to produce the same amount of work. <laughs> Makes me think about how many of you I have heard say to me over the last few years in our own economy. Well, they've downsized and now I'm getting paid the same amount of money to do my job and half of the job of the person that they just fired. More work, same pay. It's exactly what Pharaoh did to the slaves. More work, same pay which was nothing more than enough food to keep them alive. Pharaoh generates fear among the people. He generates fear because he is afraid to lose his power. And so what does he do out of his fear of losing power? He speaks to the midwives of the people and he says to them, I'm worried that if we have too many more male slaves, 
too many more Israeli, Israelite or Hebrew slaves that they're going to turn against me. So I want you to kill every newborn baby born to the Israelites. Pharaoh, in a moment of madness, out of his own fear of losing his power, his un inability to share it, chooses to kill the next generation of the very workforce that he needs for his own economy. It is stupid. It's ridiculous. And yet those are the kinds of decisions that empires make out of fear. Reminds me of how our own fear of immigrants from other nations has us turning a, a, a insensitive and repressive direction toward them, to keep them out, to not understand that our own economy is going to fail if we don't have enough workers for it. And we now, as the census just demonstrated, are at the lowest rate of reproduction in our country that we have had since before World War II. And we now are not producing enough workers to even fill the spots that we currently have. We need immigrants. Our economy needs immigrants to work, to share in our economy, to give of their energy and their enthusiasm and their imagination and their entrepreneurial spirit. We need them, but our fear has us rejecting them instead of welcoming them. When we live in fear like that, we do things today that destroy the future of other generations. If we don't have a young workforce to work in the decades ahead, when people like me retire, we will have nobody to support the social security system that we count on in our old age. The common good, the common good would call us to a different strategy to a different way of being as a nation, as a people. Well, in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of that repression, the people's cry rises to the heavens and God hears it. And we learn in the texts of Exodus that God pays peculiar and particular attention to the cries that come from the needy on the margins. And God doesn't just hear them, but God rises up with a dream, a dream of something better. God has a dream, a dream that says, a dream that says, I want a place of freedom for my people. I want a place of, for them to have land. I want a place where they can be fed. I want a place where they will have enough. And as God dreams that dream for them, God calls on human agents like Moses and Aaron to be God's mouthpiece, to speak that dream and to give birth to that dream among the people. Moses brings God's vision of abundance to confront Pharaoh's vision of scarcity. And as Moses brings that vision, we discover the fundamental battle of these two worldviews working itself out through the story of the Exodus, which we will continue to look at in the days ahead. The challenge of this text for me, the challenge of this history for me, is the reminder that when we allow ourselves to be tempted into a perspective of scarcity, it will breed all manner of destructive decisions on our part for ourselves and for the people around us. But when we can allow God's vision of abundance to inhabit our own minds and hearts and lives, then we can act courageously to establish patterns of living together in society 
that are generous and that expand opportunity instead of crushing it for others. Scarcity or abundance, control or freedom, these are the options that God sets before us in these texts from Exodus and Genesis. What shall we choose? What shall we choose in our lives? What shall we choose for the life of our church and the way we relate to the community around us? What shall we choose as a nation as we attempt to rebuild our communities after the devastation of this COVID pandemic? My prayer and my hope is that we will choose abundance and life and freedom. Let us pray. Amoroso Dios, gracias por estos textos históricos y sagrados que nos inviten a contemplar cuál es la perspectiva del cual vamos a construir nuestra sociedad. El escasez y el deseo de tener todo lo que puedo para mí mismo o abundancia y la oportunidad de expandir las oportunidades para todos. Concédenos, oh Dios, la gracia de poder tomar las opciones que tú nos indicas. Las opciones que conducen a la vida abundante para todos. Por Cristo te lo pedimos. Amén. Grateful to the God of abundance for all that God showers upon us. Grateful for the opportunity and the invitation to share what we have with those around us. I thank you for every single gift that you give to share what God has given you with this community of faith so that we can continue to share it with the community around us. So as we sing Chain Breaker, which is a song about the God who breaks our chains and sets us free, we invite you to present your tithes and your offerings in whichever way is easiest for you. A check written out and mailed in, uh, a donation dropped off at the mailbox at church, or an, an e-donation made through our website or through the link that brought you this, tech, this uh, sermon today. So however you do that, let your giving be joyful, for God indeed loves a joyful and cheerful giver. That same old road for miles and miles If you've been hearing the same old voice Tell the same old lies If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain Shaking Savior, if you got chains, he's a chain 
We've come to the end of our time today, so I just invite you to join me with prayer as we close our time out together. Let us pray. Lord, you are indeed the chain breaker. You are a prison-shaking, freedom-making Savior. And we thank you for the abundant life that you call us to in Jesus Christ and for the opportunity that we have to join with you in your chain-breaking, breaking, freedom-making work in this world. So give us hearts ready to listen and respond to the gifts that you offer, to the opportunities to serve that you bring to us, and to the freedom that we are called to walk in and fight for. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, go now. May the grace of this Jesus and the love of this liberating God and the fellowship of their communion building spirit be with you, with all of us today, tomorrow, and always. Amen. Let us close with, O oh Christ, surround me. We'll see you next week. Dios el amor que me persigue, Dios el sonido en mi voz, Dios el poder que me sostiene, Cristo envuélveme, Cristo envuélveme. Dios por detrás y a Dios y luz.